welcome to part one, chapter three of character creation in Blender, the Rhino. My name is David Radford, and here in chapter three, we're going to go over the initial refinement process, adding in more detail, smoothing out the mesh, and adding more definition to the muscles. Alright, so picking up right where we left off in the last chapter, going to be working around the hands a little bit at first, just kind of smoothing out the wrist where it attaches, and when you're working with characters that don't exist in nature, something like this, um, you kind of have to make educated guesses at how certain anatomy would be formed. So something like this where the wrist is so thick into the hand, this doesn't really exist anywhere that I know of, so you kind of have to determine what it's going to look like, make educated guesses, look at other thick joints like knees and things like that. Here I'm kind of defining the tendons and there I'm adding a little bit of fat roll where a joint that thick would would have that sort of roll. At least I think it would. Here I'm adding a little bit of volume to the hand. Also right here I am going to go down and enable collapse short edges to kind of clean up the geometry where I bully into the hand onto the arm. When you do that you end up with a lot of really short edges so you're going to want to go and clean that up anytime that you're bullying multiple objects together like that, especially with dynamic topology. You also notice that I'm still working with a detail size of 30. I'm just zooming in a lot closer to add that extra detail. Working with dynamic topology definitely has a lot of strengths. Uh, one downside to it, and this is something that you need to be aware of, is that since there is no subdivide all function, you can't move up and down in levels. But that also means that when you need your final high definition sculpt, you actually do have to brush over the entire model. So something you need to kind of be mentally prepared for when you're going into something like that. So now that I've got the hand attached and smoothed out, going to be going into object mode and I'm going to switch my background image to be a foreground image right here. Switch from front to back and leave the opacity at half. Now here I'm just rotating the model and putting the different parts of the arm in place to make sure that my proportions are correct and then I'm going to do the same thing for the body. Bring the opacity down a little bit on the on the image. and then put it back in the background and set the opacity back to what it was. Going back into sculpt mode. And you'll notice that dynamic topology has to be re-enabled every time you exit sculpt mode. So anytime that you've left sculpt mode you need to remember to go back in and turn that on. And also I was working without symmetry turned on so I had to re-symmetrize the model. going into edit mode and using proportional editing to move the hand back a little bit. And then just kind of adjusting the volume of it here, making it a little bit wider. Here I'm going to start working on the face. Now I'm going to bring my detail size down to 20. So prior to this, around the head, you could see that there was hardly any detail whatsoever. Very, very faceted. And I tend to work without smooth shading turned on just so that I can see exactly how much detail I have. If you kind of leave it if you rely on smooth shading too much, you're going to end up with weird artifacting when you do your normal baking, and you're not going to know why, especially with dynamic topology. So be aware of that. Try to keep smooth shading turned off for as long as you can. Definitely turn it on if you want to see what it looks like, but you can see right there on the front of the nose, I've gotten enough geometry that I don't need smooth shading for it to look smooth. So if you can achieve that without going too high on the poly count, by all means, do.
a lot of this chapter and the next chapter are going to be fairly redundant in the sense that all I'm really doing is going over and smoothing things out and just adding a little bit of more a little bit more detail here and there. Um, definitely good refinement process. If you only take a model 90%, it's still only 90% done. So even though the last 10% is the most tedious, it's also the most important. So here I'm kind of deviating from the concept art a little bit and adding that, that ridge that where the horn would be coming out of the nose and smoothing out the top of the horn where it's been cut off. Here I'm adding some nice rolls of skin and fat kind of on the what I guess would be the bridge of his nose. And then defining the eye sockets here. So you can see here what I'm doing for a lot of this is just adding, just brushing over an area to build up volume a little bit and then going back over and smoothing it out. So here I'm adding in placeholder eyes. I'm going to kind of put it in place there. And then I'm going to snap my cursor to the geometry and then move it to zero on the x-axis so that I can apply a mirror modifier. And then not that it really matters, but I'm going to kind of rotate the eye out just, just so I can feel good about the way that it's pointing, make sure that it looks somewhat logical. Putting in a temporary eye, uh, an actual sphere, I highly recommend this anytime that you're working with eyes, just because it gives you something to sculpt around and push geometry up against. If you're working with eyes that you've sculpted into place, you don't know that they're actually round, so if you go and rip place them with actual round eyes later for a game model or for animation or for anything like that, things aren't going to fit right and you're going to have to go back and change the model, which you don't want to do. You want to try to do everything in a logical order that makes sense so you're not redoing work. Now here I am definitely paying attention to the concept art and trying to get the right eye shape. Even though in some aspects that area doesn't make a whole lot of sense anatomically, it does match the concept and I like the concept in that se in that area. So they're working at detail size of 20 again. Just adding in that detail and smoothing it out. I'm going to switch over to a crease brush and change my curve to a tight fall off so I can get those nice little pinches between these different folds. Go back to my draw brush, start building up a little bit more volume. And all of this is just a, a refinement process, just keep reworking the geometry. It's just like working with clay. Just keep working over it until you get exactly what you want. I'll start pushing that area back. I've got to make room for that tooth when I go ahead and put that in. Using the crease brush to tighten up the lips. And just adding a nice thick area on the nostril so that it's not too thin. I want to, any nostril is going to have a little bit of fat to it, so I want to make sure that's thick enough. Refining and continuing the fat rolls on the back of the neck.
And even though the crease brush does obviously create a crease, it doesn't add the volume that I like. So you'll notice that a lot of times when I'm creating a crease, I'll use the draw brush more than I use the crease brush. I just use the crease brush to just tighten up that little, tighten up the crease just a little bit. I don't use it for the heavy lifting. I don't use it to create the crease. I just use it to kind of polish off the definition of the crease. So you can see a lot of what I'm doing, I'm not actually really adding a lot more detail. I'm just refining what's already there. And I'm adding more geometry, which is going to give me a nice normal bake later in the creation process. But I'm just building in what's already there, what's already been defined. I'm not making any major changes. There we go, I zoomed in a little bit just to be able to add a little bit more detail without changing my detail size. And once again, remember when you're doing this process that the smooth brush does not add more detail. It just smooths out the detail that's already there. So if you're trying to just keep the exact same shape, one thing that you can do is using your draw brush just set the strength down to zero so that brushing over it adds more detail but you're not actually moving it. And then you can use the smooth brush to just polish over it. Adding a little bit more volume to that back fat and kind of rounding out his tush giving this a little bit better shape to it. By this point in the sculpting process, you should already have a really solid foundation of the shapes that you're going for. Now, that's not to say that you can't enhance those as you continue this sculpt. I mean, you're just constantly refining it, so if something needs to be modified, definitely modify it. You definitely want to take each level of detail as far as you can before you start adding more detail. You don't ever want to have a 3 million poly sculpt and go, oh man, I wish you know, there was these major changes here. You definitely want to try to think of it like a block of concrete. Once you've added a lot of detail, it's hard to make big changes. You end up wasting a lot of time. So here's one area that I'm using just the normal draw brush to add a fold just by zooming in really far. So I need to find the collarbone. And giving the muscles a lot more shape to them. So now, instead of just the gross forms, I'm starting to get into actually defining the strands of the muscles and the tendons that are actually underneath the skin. So there I am brushing over really lightly just to add more detail, and then going back over and smoothing it out. Here I'm using the pinch brush as opposed to the crease brush just to tighten things up. I don't want to push it down, I just want to pinch it. Felt that roll needed a little bit more volume. Going back and polishing that. And 
And then these fat rolls on his sides, in hindsight, I wish I would have made them a little bit deeper. Um, the concept art definitely shows a fold of one layer of fat rolling onto another, and I don't think I really captured that, so I kind of wish I had put a little bit more thought into that. Starting to define the abs a little bit. In the concept art, there's not a lot of def definition of the abs, but there's just enough to, to show that there is actually muscle there. Um, this is one of those examples of where I would say it's a good idea to have reference up of like a strongman competition. So if you look those guys up, you can see that there's definitely muscle there, and you can see the forms of where they are. It's just not super chiseled like you see on the steroid ripped out guys. Defining a little bit of a belly button here. Belly buttons are really funny looking. So in chapter one, when I was working on the gross forms around the hips area, you could see that I built kind of almost a skeletal structure where the hip bones were sticking out and then it went in above the hip bones. And then here you can see I'm, I was smoothing it out and building up the fat on top of it. On the legs, this is a lot of just creative license. Mike didn't put a lot of detail into the legs, so this is all kind of educated guessing as to what the legs and backside look like. Anytime you're working with concept art that doesn't have all of the information there, that doesn't mean you can't use the concept art. I went through a, a long period of time where if all the detail wasn't there, I wouldn't use the concept art. I only used... 360 turntables or concept art that had front, back, left, right, and three-quarter view because I was really, really bad at coming up with information. And over the years, I've gotten a lot better at it. And what you have to do is just look at what's there and use those as cues as to what the concept artist would have done for the back. I mean, so here on the legs, even though the legs aren't really defined in the concept art, I can look at the top of the body and look at the, the chest and the arms and say, okay, he's using fairly realistic anatomy, but it's being morphed to conform to this character style. So when I'm down here on the legs, I'm defining fairly humanoid muscle structures, but conforming it to the stature of this particular character. So there I'm creating those tendons. If you happen to be in college, definitely take a good anatomy class or a, a nice art class where you work on human forms, life drawings, things like that. Um, you don't need to know the name of every muscle. I definitely am not good at that myself. So don't feel obligated to be able to say, oh, okay, well, that's that's the lat muscle, and that's, you know, the, I, I don't even know anything other than that, or biceps or pectoral muscles or anything like that. You don't need to know all the subclasses. As long as you know where they go and what they look like and what their shape is, that's really all that ultimately matters as an artist. Um, knowing the names is helpful if you're working at a studio where you have an art director that communicates primarily via email, and is giving you verbal directions. So when he says the bicep is just a little bit too large, you need to shrink that back a little bit, you know what he's talking about. Or when he's talking about the lats or the back muscles or anything like that, you want to be able to do that, especially if you're in that circumstance. Uh, for the most part, most of the art directors that I've worked under, they're pretty understanding that us artists, we just make things look pretty, and we don't necessarily know the name of everything. Um, they kind of treat us like we're dumb, but that makes our jobs a little bit easier sometimes, because they 
give us screenshots with nice circles that say make this like this, um, which is kind of fun because then you don't have to try to understand it. If they simplify it, it makes things easy. So once again, not going obviously completely anatomically correct, just kind of giving a nice bulbous area there for volume. Here around the toes, just I wanted to make sure that there was a nice roll of skin around where the toes or the hooves or whatever you call them go into the foot. Still only working with the detail size of 20. Uh, for the most part, you don't need to go too crazy with that. There, I brought it down to 15 to kind of create those folds in the kneecap. And using the crease brush there, So this would appear somewhat haphazard, and in some ways it kind of is, but I'm trying to kind of just get the folds correct, so anywhere that your skin bends a lot, you're going to end up with lots of little tiny folds. So if you look at the insides of your knuckles, um, your elbow probably doesn't have it unless you're a really big guy, but you can see like when you bend your elbow, you'll see where those creases are created. Same thing for your knee, um, your neck, anywhere that bends, you get those little creases. So, And the older you get, the more permanent they are. Also putting them around the back of the foot there. Figure he's been standing on these feet for a while. They're going to have some compressions down at the bottom. And then creasing up that to kind of separate the borders of what is toe and what is foot. So there I adjusted the auto smooth a little bit, just to kind of give me a slightly better result for what I wanted for that particular crease. Bringing my strength up a little bit. As you can see, I really don't care what angle I'm looking at the model from. I'm just trying to define the right shapes. So I, I apologize if it confuses you when I'm working with the model when he's upside down. Uh, it's kind of my workflow just to be able to look at it from all different angles. Start working on the elbow a little bit. Elbows, when your arm's out straight, your elbow actually kind of makes a funny little bunch right there. So. So here I'm giving a little bit more definition to where the bicep goes into the forearm. This is something you don't really see in most actual people, uh, unless they're way tripped out on steroids or something like that. Um, that type of definition is usually covered up by fat, or most people don't have that much muscle. So that's one of those things where you'd be looking at anatomy reference or some crazy bodybuilder that has that level of definition to be able to determine where those muscles are going to be and how they're going to flow. Kind of getting an overview of what he looks like now. When you're working on any sort of character, the biggest problem that I see 
in most beginning character modelers or sculptors is not having enough volume. So the pectoral muscles will be too flat, the abs will be too flat, the belly will be too flat, hands are too flat. Push things further than you think they should be, and then if it looks too too far, scale it back. It's always easy to scale things back. It's definitely hard to push things further. Here I'm using the crease brush really, really subtle just to kind of give a little bit of definition to the abs there. And once again, that's a great time to have anatomy reference up to see exactly what the shapes of the muscles are. working on smoothing out the hands, adding more detail here. So you can see right now I'm not actually refining the shape, I'm just adding more geometry. So I'm just brushing over it really lightly and then smoothing it back out. And just like I talked about in chapter one, you can see I clearly do not stay in the same area of the model for very long, continually moving around it, changing things and refining the whole model as one piece instead of okay the hands are done and nothing else is you definitely want to keep moving don't slow down if you stay on one spot too long and you get the hands looking great I mean the hands are absolutely perfect they are the best of the best you've ever seen and then you zoom out and the rest of it looks like chewed up bubblegum it's really demotivating so that's why I, that's one reason that I move around a lot is just to to stay motivated. Using the crease brush to kind of define where the fingernails are going in. Now you can use the crease brush inverted as well. So don't be afraid to do that. That's just going to push it out and pinch it, as opposed to push it in and pinch it. Makes perfect sense. So here I'm using it to push in, and then when I'm working on the edge of the fingernails where it sticks out above the, the finger, I'll use it inverted sometimes. Bring my detail size down a little bit further. Now I'm working at 10. Also, the level of detail that you choose to put into your model is heavily dictated by how close you're going to see it. There's no sense putting in more detail than you're ever going to see, whether that's in a render, whether that's in a game. Um, it doesn't matter. I mean, if you're never going to, you know, if a guy's going to be wearing boots all the time, don't waste time modeling feet. Make the boots. Same thing applies to, you know, just general anatomy. If you're never going to see the guy's palms, don't spend that much time working on the palm of the hand. Using the crease brush just to add some light folds over the, the majority of the body here. Anywhere skin bends or flexes, just trying to add some variation to it. you also notice that even though I'm working on a symmetrical model, I'll work on both sides of it. And that's simply because working on one side the whole time, you get the exact same perspective. So when you switch over and you look at the other side, you'll notice things that you didn't see the first time. I've seen some artists that work on just one half of the model. They don't even have the, the symmetry modifier enabled. 
and they do the whole thing, and then they turn on symmetry, and then they spend another day again refining that because they didn't see all the problems because they were only looking at one side of it. Here I'm experimenting using the inflate brush to kind of put some veins in. I decided I didn't like it. At this point, our rhino is well on its way to completion. In the fourth and final chapter of part one, we are going to be finishing up the refinement process, adding his ears and teeth, as well as adding what little clothing and accessories he has. 